Welcome, everybody, to Fantasy Football Today, DFS. This is your Week 17 recap and your Week 18 early luck. Um, you know, I want to start the show by obviously sending our thoughts and prayers to Damar Hamlin. A very just scary situation that I think we're all just sort of bracing ourselves, waiting for, you know, hopefully wishing for some good news uh, over the next 24 hours, which I'm, I'm hoping we get updates. Um, that would be great. I, I do want to say... I'm really encouraged by what the Twitter community and just what the community at large has done, uh, particularly exemplified in the toy drive, um, Damar Hamlin's toy drive, which, uh, you know, it, for those of you that don't know, had a $2,500 goal and has now exceeded $6 million. So, um, you know, some really cool stuff that we see from the community uh, in tragedy sometimes. And, and I think that's really cool. But again, thoughts are with Damar Hamlin. I do, before we get to our lineup recap, you know, Zach is with us as he is every single show. Uh, we're obviously doing this on a Wednesday. We didn't do our show yesterday. We, we are going to have our game by game uh, review with Mike McClure on Thursday. But Zach, if I could bring you on, because, you know, this is just one of those situations that I think um, we are not going to forget. And Zach, I know we are awaiting good news. We're very hopeful for good news as it pertains to DeMar Hamlin. Uh, I just kind of wanted to get your thoughts. Obviously, football and things like this show are entirely secondary to the life and well-being of a football player. And I just, you know, I, I don't want to be on this show just talking to myself and talking to, the, to those that are in, in the chat. And we see you. Hello there. Uh, Zach, what are your thoughts with just the, the whole situation and, and um, your thoughts on Damar Hamlin? He was terrifying. I've never seen anything like that in a sporting event ever because you normally if it's a, it's a serious injury like that you think okay it's probably something spinal or you think it's something with like head trauma and then they say that they'll give you like a heads up that you're good but the fact that they like the four commercial breaks scared the hell out of me they're like what yeah. is going on here these guys are terrible my normal my normal rule of thumb for for injuries is the guy gets injured and the players are standing around him you know it's a decent injury if the players are kneeling you know it's a bad injury Seeing these players crying on the field, you knew it was something horrible. Yeah, exactly. And I do want to credit uh, the first responders that that raced to the scene and to the extent DeMar Hamlin makes a recovery and hopefully some sort of full recovery. Um, I think we can credit all of those people who rushed to his aid um, that were on the sidelines and did everything they possibly could to make sure his life was preserved. So um, if anybody is in the chat, I, I see some of you in the chat. If you want to share your thoughts in the chat or, you know, whatever, you want to share your thoughts on Twitter. You don't, I'm not saying to tag us. I just I, I do think Twitter is is a really good place that sort of mobilized everybody, whether it was to to donate to the to the Damar Hamlin toy drive or whether it was just to extend thoughts and prayers or share information. Um, you know, one thing I tweeted out yesterday was I, I'm I'm just so encouraged by social media because, I, Zach, I, I know that social media can be a haven for negativity and for for differentiating one from the other. It's just it's it's a place where you can really kind of immerse yourself in the negative. But that's your choice. Right. You, you can you can scroll past that stuff if you want. And, and when you do, I think you find a lot of positive stuff. And I think what we have seen over the last couple of days uh, in terms of a response to this event, I, I think it has been a lot of positive stuff. And I would encourage everybody because I don't think this sh should ever be in just the wake of tragedy. I would encourage everybody to the extent, stop yourself right now. And to the extent you find yourself, I want you to be introspective for a second. You find yourself attaching yourselves to Twitter accounts or Instagram accounts or Facebook accounts that tend to be negative and tend to just try to be divisive. I would encourage you to, to pull away from those those things, those accounts, because I think if you just focus on the positive, the positive people in your life or the positive people that you follow on social media, you are going to end up being more positive. You are going to end up taking steps forward as opposed to stagnating or taking steps back. And I just this is a moment for everybody, I think, to look to the positive people in their life because they are going to pull you forward. They are going to make you thankful every single day. They are going to make you give gratitude every single day. And uh, we don't need to remind ourselves only in tragedy to do that. Let's just be introspective on a regular basis and find out who we need to kind of shuffle away and who we need to move forward with. So, yeah. Zach, before we get into the lineup recap, any sort of final thoughts? Yeah, definitely 100 percent agree. And I was, I was really, really impressed with just kind of like Twitter as a whole that people were so like caring and like nothing really else matters in that moment. The football game is meaningless. 
Right. Like it doesn't. I'm, I'm obviously it was fantasy championships. I didn't see anybody tweeting about the fantasy championship because that's that means nothing. Right. The, the, the lives are what matter, and making sure this guy's okay is the only thing that counts. So I'm glad the, the first responders were amazing. It's amazing the the just the personnel they have at these games just in wake of tragedy. And mm-hmm. the people at the University of Cincinnati, where he's currently being held, are doing a phenomenal job. And we're seeing brief updates, but obviously we want to see a full recovery and uh, hoping for the best. But with the outpouring of support for people donating to the toy drive, I don't know if you saw, he's the number one selling jersey on Fanatics over the last two days. I and, did not see that. Yeah, That's really and, cool. And they're donating all the proceeds from the, his jersey sales to um, his, his foundation. So, like, I can't wait to see the dude, the Damar, wake up. And then to see this outpouring support would be yeah. terrible. So, like, it, and we know his family has seen this, and and they are very encouraged by it too. So, all of our efforts uh, are are being recognized. I, I shouldn't take ownership of those. All, all of everyone's efforts um, are being recognized. So, I, I just think it's really cool. You're right, Zach. This is an unprecedented event, and there's not a there's not a right way. There's a wrong way to react to stuff like this, but there's certainly not a right way. We we don't know how to navigate the right way. What we do know is, you know, we are at the forefront of our minds is DeMar Hamlin and him getting better and waiting for updates on DeMar Hamlin. We do have, you know, a a full NFL slate of games. And I know some people at at some point are going to be interested in the DFS lineups. And maybe that's not today. I I don't know, but you know, there, you know, there are games to be played. And so we figured perhaps as a distraction, you know, we do two shows a week and this is our first show of the week on a Wednesday. It's normally on a Tuesday. Um, we thought maybe we we would provide that distraction and just do our regular show, um, but we wanted to make sure that we recognized Demar Hamlin, the entire community for the support that they've given to Demar Hamlin and his family. I think it's really amazing. And again, I don't think this should only be recognized. That these things should only be recognized in the wake of a tragedy. I think everybody that's listening to this should really take steps and try to focus on the positive whether there's a tragedy or not, because there's a lot of positive out there. But if you focus, particularly on social media, if you focus on the negative people and the negative things, because those are the things that get retweets more often than not, well, then you are going to be negative too. And I just think we are in a really positive moment right now in terms of how we have rallied. And I don't want that to go away when we find out Damar Hamlin is better. You know, I want it to be pervasive. I want it to exist. So everybody listening to this, Please immerse yourself in the positive, not the negative, because it will be better for you and the community at large. Yeah, I, w- I wish people would would celebrate others. Obviously, when people pass, everybody likes to celebrate them. I wish we'd do it while they're still here. Yeah, 100 percent, 100 percent true, 100 percent. OK, with that said, let's um, let's move along to to our lineup recap. No, no great way to transition to that, but let's give it a shot. I do want to congratulate our FFT DFS winner from last week. That was the intrepid one. Really cool screen name. That's a nice switch. Normally we have like David 4732. That's like the screen name. This guy's got a cool screen name. The intrepid one won our FFT DFS contest. We we have our week 18 contest live. Um, so go ahead and register for that if you can. Um, note that there's a two game slate on Saturday, which is really interesting. And we'll touch on it when we do the game by game preview with Mike tomorrow. We'll touch on that two game slate. It's the Chiefs at the Raiders with the highest total of the week, um, 52 and a half. And that's mostly because the Chiefs can't stop anybody. I mean, this is your this is your projected Super Bowl champion. Kansas City fans that got all, all over me in the middle of the year. I'm just saying they, they might win it. But this defense is just deplorable, which gives uh, Jared Stidham and company some viability in that 52 and a half point total. They're seven and a half point dogs, by the way. Um, the Titans at the Jaguars is the other game uh, on Saturday. That's obviously a gigantic game because the winner goes to the playoffs just so everybody knows the Jaguars are favored by six and a half points. And that's only a 40 point total. Uh, keep in mind the Titans starting quarterback, not Ryan Tannehill, not Malik Willis. It is none other than Joshua Dobbs, who actually showed out pretty well under the circumstances, was only with the team for about seven days. And I thought played pretty well against that um, Cowboys defense. Okay, with that said, I think we can get to our lineup recap. I didn't have a great week. My cash lineup, I, I had one cash lineup this week and it was it was good. <laughs> well, good enough to cash. I should say, um, but it, you know, it wasn't great. And again, I, I can't stress enough. This is why you play cash. You can have lineups that have a bunch of snowflakes that have no Mike Evans that have really no superstars and you can still cash. This was a tournament. You can see it on this screen. If you're watching us on YouTube, 
Um, if you can, hit the like button. If you haven't already reviewed this podcast, it literally takes actually one second. You go to the, you literally go to Apple Podcasts and you scroll down, you hit five stars. One second. That's not an exaggeration. If you want to put a few words in there, maybe you, you bump that up to five seconds. You say, hey, this is a great show. Really help me out in fantasy. Whatever you want to say there. That would be great. Um, but this one, if you see at the top of the screen, this was 666 entries. Um, the top 300 got paid. So it's like basically a double up. But, you know, obviously we're, we're not talking about a clean 50 percent here. But the point is I had a lineup and I'll just for those of you listening and not watching. I'll just rattle off the names here. Jared Goff, Saquon Barkley, Tyler Algier, Justin Jefferson, Amon Ross St. Brown, Greg Dortch, Tyler Conklin, Leonard Fournette, and the Packers defense. The only fire emojis I have on this team are Jared Goff, who barely got there. Well, no, he didn't barely get there because he was so low priced, but he should have been a lot better. He had 22 points. Tyler Conklin, 80 receiving yards and six receptions. That'll give you a fire emoji for a $2,900 player. That's 14 points. And then the Packers defense, which, frankly, I took out of sort of desperation because I, I kind of ran out of money and I figured Kirk Cousins on the road, like uh, might not be great. I understand I'm playing Justin Jefferson in this cash lineup, but I thought both could coexist. The reality was I was getting the Packers at 2,300. It allowed me to get Justin Jefferson, who was very high priced at 9,500. It allowed me to get Amon Ross St. Brown. It allowed me to get Saquon Barkley. So that's where that came from. It ended up helping me out considerably because without that defense, I would not have cashed. Listen, this is an okay. This is actually a bad lineup, in my opinion. But again, I got to stress play cash games or at least play some cash games. If you're just averse to playing lineups that, that, that don't have the potential to hit big, at least have a few because this lineup only scored 110 points and it was worth 100 bucks. I won 100 bucks on a lineup that is extremely underwhelming. I went for volume, obviously. Saquon, Tyler Algier, you know, I thought I'd be getting some volume with Justin Jefferson, obviously Amon Ross St. Brown, Tyler Conklin, we talked about in terms of a matchup against Seattle, Leonard Fournette, I thought he'd get more volume. I was wrong almost across the board, but boom, I doubled up. I was in the top 300 out of 666, nothing to celebrate. I'm just trying to accentuate the point that you should be playing some cash games. It doesn't have to be as low, like there's, there's a lot that are in the you know, a lot of them are in like the 2000 range in terms of entries. Those are fine. A thousand. Those are fine. Five thousand. Those are fine. Do a single entry double up. And I, I don't think you'll regret it. So we can move past this lineup in my GPP lineup. I'll talk about how underwhelming some of these players were, because, again, in, in, from a tournament standpoint, I just didn't have a good week. Uh, thank goodness for my cash lineup, because otherwise I would have lost um, a decent amount of money. Now, Mike's GPP lineup surprisingly didn't win. I say surprisingly because. Mike was talking to us about the Tom Brady stacks. We, this, when he did his top three, Tom Brady was on that top three. And I think a lot of people, especially after the week before, they were like, no, I'm not playing Tom Brady again. I, and I was one of those people, by the way. Uh, I saw what he did against Arizona. He couldn't even exploit them. They just looked awful. And frankly, against Carolina, they didn't look very good either. But they, <laughs> they got to a point where they just decided – I like the Mike Evans matchup and this Henderson guy can't cover him. Let's see if he can get loose. And it was just the Henderson show. Fournette kind of got phased out. Godwin kind of got phased out. And it really became it really became uh, Tom Brady to, to Mike Evans. Mike Evans had 200 yards and those lineups really work. So if we can pull up Mike's GPP lineup here. Now he scored 121.08 points. He had Tom Brady. He had him with Chris Godwin, which isn't bad, but it's not Mike Evans, obviously. He had him with Leonard Fournette. And that was a stack I had in, in a couple of tournaments as well on Mike's advice. And honestly, it absolutely could have worked out. It just so happens Mike Evans finally, finally got loose. And if you didn't have Mike Evans in your lineup, you pretty much didn't have a shot at an outright. Here we have Tom Brady, like I said, Godwin and Leonard Fournette. The, the problem with the lineup was he stuck with Ramondre Stevenson. I was pretty much off Ramondre Stevenson by the time Sunday rolled around. We actually had some tweets about, uh, you know, whether we should stick with Ramondre Stevenson or not with Damian Harris being active. Um, he stuck with him and it, and it didn't pay off. He only had seven points. Fournette certainly didn't pay off. I don't blame Mike or myself for playing Leonard Fournette. I thought the volume made a ton of sense there. It just, just so happens they were able to utilize their receivers and their boundary receivers more than they normally do. I thought in the when they were down double digits in the second half, I thought there was going to be a lot of dump offs to Leonard Fournette. It just didn't happen. Alan Lazard, uh, pretty underwhelming here. Christian Watson obviously was active there. So those are decisions you have to make. Christian Watson's active. Do you still want to play Alan Lazard? Damian Harris is active and ready to roll. Do you want to play Ramondre Stevenson? Um, I got away from both of those guys for the most part. 
But if you want to stick with him just on the on the assumption that maybe Watson doesn't get a full complement of snaps or maybe just all the attention goes to Lazard regardless and Ramondre gets a full complement of snaps and is productive, I totally get it. Greg Dorch was okay. You know, only only uh, four receptions for 15 yards. I mean, four receptions for 50 yards would have been okay, but that chalk didn't end up working out, but it did make your lineup allowed it it allowed your lineup to do a lot of different things so I, you know that's not necessarily a regrettable move at 33 percent. that that's pretty tough though I, I didn't necessarily think he'd be that popular in in tournaments more a cash game play tj hawkinson at six percent saquon barkley didn't do anything i had a little bit of fear of saquon barkley because i thought that indianapolis d was a little formidable but i decided to play him anyway because i thought the this is mike's lineup but i'm just saying i decided to play him anyway because i thought he'd get so much volume and be able to break a run like he typically does and it just didn't happen. It doesn't surprise me, though. I thought Barkley was kind of a boomer bust play. I was willing to play the boom. The bust came in. 25% ownership, not ideal. And then we got the 49ers defense at 40% ownership. That one's tough, too. Any defense at 40% ownership. You know, I played a lot of the Niners, too. Uh, I didn't think the ownership was going to creep that high. I thought there were other defenses that were pretty popular, including like the Patriots at 2,600. So again, this lineup didn't, you know, Mike took some chances. He stuck to his guns. And in this case, it just didn't work out for him. And when I say stuck to his guns, I'm talking playing the Niners chalk, playing the Barkley chalk, and then sticking with Lazard and Stevenson, kind of knowing that there were some healthy people behind them. Could it have paid off? Yeah. Did he have the right stack? I mean, he had Tom Brady. You know, if he switches out Chris Godwin for Mike Evans, all of a sudden this this lineup obviously cashes in a pretty big way. So he was on the right track with Tom Brady stacks. It just he had Godwin and Fournette instead of Mike Evans, and nobody can blame him for that. So let's move on to my GPP lineup. This is another one that didn't cash again. Thank goodness for my cash lineup, because if not for that, it would have been a bad week for me. And, and fortunately, I kind of bumped up the uh, the price tag for my entry fee for my cash lineup. So that helped a little bit, but no dice on this one. 114 points. I had Jared Goff. The way I tried to switch this one up is as I had Jared Goff double stacked. I knew everybody was pretty much going to have Jared Goff to Amon Ross St. Brown. DJ Shark was my second guy in there. And, I, you know, he ended up being pretty popular. But I wonder how many people had Shark with Amon Ross St. Brown. Probably a decent amount. But still, I thought I was getting a little different with that stack. DJ Shark didn't end up doing much. Amon Ross St. Brown didn't end up doing much. If you played this stack, or any any variation of this stack, you got a little unlucky because Justin Fields came out firing. And by firing, I mean running for 100 yards in the first quarter. And it looked like this was going to be quite the back and forth affair where you're looking at like a 45 to 40 game. No defense was stopping anybody. The problem was Justin Fields aggravated an injury that he had, he had, had uh, for some time, a lower leg injury, thigh injury. And that Put the brakes on everything and it put the brakes on the scoring. I mean, if you had a golf stack or frankly, if you had a Justin Field stack, they got pretty unlucky. The injury bug tagged you. And, and unfortunately, it, it meant that the Detroit Lions didn't really have to press the ball. Now, they scored 41 points, but it didn't have the sort of back and forth. We need to pass type uh, vibe that you wanted from this game. So. The golf ended up coming through, but if you had him stacked with a bunch of receivers and you had a bunch of, you know, Komet runbacks, Komet was the leading receiver on this team with 27 receiving yards. You know how I know that? I had a, I, I hit most of my props last week, which I do on the early edge, but I lost the Cole Komet prop because I had him over 32 and a half receiving yards. He was the leading receiver for the Bears with 27 receiving yards. That's how bad this thing got post first quarter for the Chicago Bears. So, Again, unfortunate circumstances there. You were on the right track, obviously, with the Detroit stack. It was very chalky, of course. So if you got away from it, congratulations. I had Dalvin Cook here because I wanted to be contrarian again, try to be contrarian off Justin Jefferson. We know you can run against Green Bay. I thought, listen, everybody's frustrated with Dalvin Cook. There's not a lot of people that are going to play him. It's a good in game, game environment, but maybe Dalvin Cook just isn't that guy. Maybe Minnesota doesn't believe in him. I don't know what's going on, but he just doesn't get the work and he's really not getting through the holes like I remember Dalvin Cook getting through. So that didn't work out. Isaiah Pacheco didn't work out. Um, I don't really regret that play again. Denver <laughs> has a late lead against Kansas City. I mean, Kansas City, like what's going on here, guys? Houston, D Denver, like if you can't shut down teams, then Isaiah Pacheco is obviously worthless. So it, it, it will be the Jarek McKinnon show the rest of the season for the most part, because in these competitive games, it, they defer to Jarek McKinnon in big spots. And Pacheco gets some volume, but not enough to justify playing, especially at the price of uh, an upper 5K range. So that didn't work out. Cole Komet didn't work out. Tyler Algier was good, just not great. 
he, he got a decent amount of volume. That Arizona defense was actually pretty decent, only losing the game by one with David Blau at the quarterback position. And then I went ahead and played a chalky defense as well in the 49ers defense. Not a great lineup, uh, but I like what I did with Dalvin Cook. I, I thought that absolutely could have worked out. I had Chris Godwin in there, which obviously did work out. Um, Tyler Algier, I don't regret at, at high ownership because I thought he could have absolutely gone off. And again, Isaiah Pacheco, I'm thinking this is going to be a dominant performance by Kansas City. He could go for two touchdowns in 80 yards. So um, I have no issue with this lineup. It just didn't work out. And again, I needed the Chicago Bears to push the uh, Detroit Lions and it just didn't work out. So we can move on to um, and we are going to take an early look, by the way. This is a weird week uh, because. Well, for a lot of different reasons, frankly, but the main reason is because there's a lot of teams that don't have much to play for. And there's a lot of teams that do have a lot to play for. So you got to, and there's not a lot of high totals. We're going to really going to have to parse through that. We're going to do a little parsing through that today, but tomorrow is going to be the day with Mike, where we do our game by game preview, where we're really going to have to identify what direction we want to go. And frankly, we're going to need more news as the week matriculates. So that this is something that if you want to reach out to me on Twitter, on Saturday or whatever day and, you know, ask me some follow-up questions. I'm happy to answer them. But Thursday, we're going to have a much clearer picture on the direction we want to go. But before we get to that early look and we, we touch on those things, let's look at the FFT DFS winner lineup. It's the intrepid one. He put up 186 points with Justin Fields. I love that play. It should have worked out even better for the intrepid one. 12% ownership, 21 points. Honestly, this could have been a 40 spot very easily. He had Ken Walker as his running back at 0.5% ownership. Ken Walker started out that game super hot. Leonard Fournette at 42% ownership. I think that really tells you that these people, you know, people listening to this show, watching this show are kind of dialed in because we were, as a show, big on Fournette. Didn't work out. Understand the play. Speaking of Fournette volume, he had Keenan Allen looking for volume there. Didn't work out. Devontae Smith did work out. 115 receiving yards, nine receptions, gets the 100-yard bonus. Very solid uh, from Devontae Smith. Mike Evans, well, that's the big ticket, right? That's why you won. You don't play Chris Godwin, you play Mike Evans. You play Fournette with Mike Evans with no Tom Brady. Really clever way to do it. We saw it, we saw it two weeks ago when we had a bunch of those Giants receivers, but we didn't have them stacked with Daniel Jones. Remember, we had Gardner Minshew at 4,800 and Isaiah Hodgins and Richie James. So these are the types of stacks, especially come playoff season, where you really want to consider doing this. I actually did this very same idea with that um, with that Falcons Arizona game, where I took a couple pieces from from each team at the receiver position, but I didn't play the quarterback in either of those games. And I think come playoff time, you're really going to want to get familiar with these types of constructions because they're going to be relatively different. So again, Fournette, you treat as a pass catcher more than anything because he doesn't do anything efficiently in the running game. He is a pass catcher. So. Fournette, pass catcher. Mike Evans, pass catcher. No Tom Brady. I totally get it. Justin Fields could have absolutely gone off. But Mike Evans scores 51.7 points. Over 200 yards, 207 to be exact. 10 receptions. Gets the 100-yard bonus. Oh, and by the way, three receiving touchdowns. Just an epic performance at 6.2%. Um, listen, these are the guys that we know have the upside. We know they have the potential. So as frustrated as you might be with guys that just haven't performed, if you know they're still running those routes, and you know guys like Tom Brady are still going to target them one or two or three times on those routes. Listen, Mike Evans is a big, strong, slightly fast receiver. He can get behind a defense clearly. So don't let your frustration pour over into every other game. There, there are going to be times where guys like this flash. Did I play him? No. I, I played him last week on, on the three-game slate, and it didn't work out. So I decided I wasn't going to go back to him. And that's to my detriment, but to the intrepid one's favor. Tyler Conklin was his tight end. We talked about on the show. That was one of Mike's favorite tight ends, if not his favorite. KJ Osborne, pretty smart play. Get a piece in here. It's not the Justin Jefferson piece, but KJ Osborne made a lot of sense. You knew when Jair Alexander opened his mouth, by the way, talking about Justin Jefferson. You know, he's not an idiot. When he opened his mouth and talked about how lucky Justin Jefferson uh, was the last time they played, he knew they were going to roll cover. He knew it wasn't going to be Jair Alexander on an island with Justin Jefferson. He knew the game plan. He knew that they were going to roll coverage to Justin Jefferson and try to take him out. He didn't want to look like an idiot. He knows Justin Jefferson can beat him one-on-one -on, -one on, on pretty much nine out of 10 times. So, it, it, you know, in retrospect, and that's part of the reason I played Dalvin Cook, but in retrospect, you had to think that Jair kind of knew what he was doing when he talked that trash. So, uh, something to think about there when, when you hear stuff like that, the narrative building, it can go the other way too. And not, I'm not saying KJ Osborne was like an obvious play because it certainly wasn't, but 
you know, you get a piece from this game and KJ Osborne has flashed in the past. He, when he gets volume, he really gets volume. And frankly, Adam Thielen really hasn't been that guy. So um, really good lineup here. We, we see uh, the Saints defense, which, which helped him out a little bit as well, obviously. Um, but that's the FFT DFS winner. And um, Zach, before we get to our early look and some of these playoff scenarios, um, I do want to bring you on because I think we might have some news. Yeah, so minuscule breaking news. Um, the Dolphins are adding Mike Glennon to the practice squad, so we might see him this weekend. Yeah. Yeah, and I know you mentioned Justin Jefferson, so I'm sure you saw that uh, we made a freezing cold takes on Sunday night. Well, I, oh, I, I, I haven't seen that, believe I, it or not. Yeah, so I, I was kind of hyping in. For, well, the FFT account made it, thanks to me, which is a great honor. Um, Not really at all. But um, no, so I was kind of getting into the whole Jefferson Jair thing over the week. Basically, like, I, it's like, what do you say? It was a fluke. And then he's basically like, Justin Jefferson deleted his social media. You're like, this dude's about to go, like, nuclear. And then obviously he walks in and the uh, Jair shows up to the game. I embedded the tweet and said when he's like Jair's in a little dance. And I said, when you're about to give up 300 yard, or 200 yards and three touchdowns to Justin Jefferson, that didn't happen. Um, one, yeah. catch, one catch for 15. Turns out that stat line went to Mike Evans. But uh, yeah, freezing cold takes. They they got us pretty good. So lots of fun on that. That's, that's pretty great. So we have a question in the chat. And by the way, uh, I got to say this. I, I got the news on Mike Glennon uh, yesterday, but it was from like, seriously, uh, last night, actually. But it was from a source that I didn't. Uh, he, it sounded like he wanted it, me to keep it hush hush. And at the end of the day, it's Mike Glennon news. It's not like I'm I'm breaking something ginormous. So I kept it to myself. But that's why when you said the Mike Glennon thing, yeah. I didn't know that that broke anywhere. But yeah. that's why I was like, yeah. Because that's amazing. Um, it's amazing you have a source that only gives you updates about Mike Glennon. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> well, source. Yeah, I guess he gives me he gives me news about the Dolphins in general because he's he's based down here. But um, yeah, I knew the Mike Glennon news, and I I don't even know what to think of it. I, you feel better yeah. with him than Skyler Thompson, though, if you're playing Waddle. Or well, him. so so the question for from a fantasy standpoint it, to me is, at this point in time, are Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddle more valuable from a DFS standpoint because the Dolphins have a lot to play for, and we're going to get to that in a second. Um, I think Mike Glennon, I think Mike Glennon gives them more value because he's just going to stay in the pocket. He's going to get the ball out quick. He's going to make mistakes for sure. But I think he is going to, he's a really bright kid. I, I think he's going to be able to pepper uh, some of these, you know, you know, whether they get the yak or not is a different question, but I think he is going to pepper both of these targets, particularly Tyree kill in a must win. And I trust him to do that more than I do Scott. And that's no offense to Skylar Thompson. He's just a young kid and he's not you know, a, a clean pocket passer yet, but um, we did have a question here. I don't think I've answered it yet. How many targets did Dorch get? He got 10. Yeah. So, you know, it's one of those things like, you, you, may, you know, Dorch was the right play, particularly in cash. In tournaments, you know, in retrospect, I, I think, you know, one guy I brought up on the Tuesday solo pod, and I think I brought him up on the game by game preview. I brought up uh, Rashid Shahid. Now he was $1,000 more, but I think he would have been a really good pivot off of Greg Dorch. He's electric. He's electric. All he does is make plays. Oh. He's oh, like, yeah. And, and for the record, on the early edge, and I'm sorry I didn't talk about him more on the Thursday show. I know, again, I know I talked about him on Tuesday, but on the early edge, one of my five props on the week was Rashid Shahid's over, which was uh, it was 37 and a half receiving yards. And he got that in the first half, I believe. This guy, and that was with Chris Olave back, by the way. I mean, Rashid Shahid's like the real deal. So, and that's a guy I think to consider this week uh, i'm trying to remember his price but uh, but i have it i have it down here when we get to the early look but um i see some other uh things in in this chat everybody thanks for being in here garrett says just finished the first cut and saw you pick xander as your one and done i like hoblin this week says garrett i like hoblin this week as well um but from a one and done standpoint i thought xander was the play with a elevated purse everybody watch the first cut if you're into golf the first cut has shows every single day and i'm on the dfs show um, which is every Monday at 5.30. And by the way, there's a brand new golf show that the Early Edge is launching, and it begins, Garrett and everybody else, today at 3 o'clock. It's me, Patrick McDonald, and the coach, Jonathan Coachman. So, Garrett, definitely check that out at 3 o'clock today. It's kind of like a soft launch today, but we are going to be going the rest of the, rest of the season, which is 34 straight weeks uh, talking golf. I'll be on the first cut on Monday, and I'll be on this Early Edge brand new show at three o'clock every single Wednesday. I see a happy new year from Richie Smalls. Uh, happy new year to you. 
Um, Josh D says, do you think Josh Jacobs will play a full game this week? Man, I certainly hope not. Uh, but judging by the way the Raiders do things, um, and they're probably going to want to compete in this game, the total looks at 52 and a half. It looks very high, very potentially competitive. I I'm guessing Josh Jacobs will play. Uh, I think he's already pretty much secured the rushing title. So I don't think he really has anything to play for, but we're, you know, Josh, we're going to have to wait on news uh, for that. So uh, we want to take, uh, Zach, we're going to take that early look at week 18. I can't believe it's week 18. We're going to take an early look at week 18 pricing. But before we do that, we're going to hear a message from our partners. We are charged to protect these kids. Go! I'm a police officer for North Minneapolis and coach for the North High High School. Go! These kids don't trust cops. It's definitely a difficult time right now. It's kind of weird, but I'm building bonds with police. The violence is nonstop. You can hear the gunshots. But when them lights flicker at 7 o'clock, you ain't hearing none of that. And we are back. This is Fantasy Football Today, DFS. It's Wednesday morning, a little bit of an unusual time that we do this show. Uh, we are going to be doing our game-by-game -game preview tomorrow, I believe at our regular time, uh, which is going to be 5 o'clock, of course, on Thursday. Thank you, for everybody, for being in here. I know it's an odd time. Uh, Justin, I see you in here. John, I see you in here. I'll try to get to your question at the end of the show. Uh, let's see. There's so many playoff implications, it's a little confusing. I'm not going to go over every single scenario because I might mess something up, but I do want to talk about some games that I know are going to be meaningful, that I know where the, the starters are going to get trotted out, and some games where they're not. So try to follow me here. I'll just probably go for the next you know, 60 to 90 seconds talking about different playoff scenarios. And if you hear your team or you hear a, a, a game you think you want to play, just make sure you focus on that. So uh, the Bengals and the Ravens, I think we're still dealing with a, a bit of an unknown with, with those two teams and, and the Bills and the Chiefs uh, for obvious reasons. So, you know, we, we just kind of have to wait on that. Um, the, the Titans and Jaguars, I already talked about the Chiefs. That's a Saturday slate. So we'll talk about the Saturday slate on the game by game preview tomorrow. But again, that's going to be a really fun slate. And uh, there's a lot of there's a lot to play for. I Again, I to, to Josh's question about Josh Jacobs. Wait, is Josh D. Josh Jacobs? Maybe, maybe Josh Jacobs is watching the show and he's trying to get me to say, hey, Josh, don't play like I've been saying the last two weeks. But both of those games are going to be very competitive, in my opinion, uh, potentially high scoring. So Saturday slate should be fun and we will we'll have a lot more knowledge going into those two games than we will the Sunday games. Um, the Vikings and the Buccaneers, I think, are very likely to sit some starters among other teams. So I'll just kind of go down the list here. Uh, Patriots, Dolphins and Steelers all have something to play for here. Dolphins need a win to get in. And uh, and that's against the Jets. And they need a Patri uh, Patriots loss to the Bills. Uh, the Patriots need to beat the Bills or have the Dolphins, Steelers and Titans lose uh, the Steelers. They actually have something to play for, too, believe it or not. Credit to Mike Tomlin. Steelers need to win and they need the Pats and the Dolphins to lose. That's possible, folks. I mean, can you imagine Mike Tomlin making the playoffs under the under these circumstances? This guy should be in the running for coach of the year every single year. Just plain and simple. Uh, the Eagles, they play the Giants. The Eagles, uh, they certainly have something to play for. They got to lock up that number one seed. We don't know about Jalen Hurts yet. I suspect he's going to play. I don't know that we know that for a fact yet. Giants don't really have anything to play for. I know uh, Brian Dable said he's going to play as starters. I think he's probably going to backtrack a little bit on that as the week goes. I mean, it's one thing to play your stars. It's another thing to play them all four quarters. So I have a feeling you're not going to want to play any starting Giants, whether you want to look to some backups. That's something maybe we can talk about on the game-by-game -game preview tomorrow. Packers, Lions, and Seahawks. Now, the Packers control their own destiny against the Lions. Just keep in mind the Packers and Lions play on Sunday night, so that is not a part of the main slate. The Lions need the Seahawks. Uh, to lose to the Rams and they need to beat Green Bay. So I bring that up for main slate purposes because the Seahawks are very much in play. They have a lot to play for. Seahawks need to win and they need the Lions to beat Green Bay. Um, interesting circumstances with that game flex to Sunday night. But um, Seattle's certainly in a tough spot, right? Because if they win, then the Lions have nothing to play for but they need the Lions to win. So, <laughs> ouch. Uh, but the good news is the Lions coach is Dan Campbell. 
You think Dan Campbell's going to be like, yeah, I'm going to sit my starters on national television, even though I have nothing to play for. In, in fact, that's going to embolden Dan Campbell even more. So I actually don't think it hurts the Seahawks as much as conventional wisdom would suggest. So I, I again, Seattle has a lot to play for, uh, something to consider there. The 49ers get the one seed with uh, the Eagles law with an Eagles loss and a 49ers win. So Niners still have something to play for too. The problem is, the spread in that Eagles game is, is gigantic because the anticipation is that the Giants are not going to roll their starters out for four quarters. I believe that line is like 13 or 14 in favor of the Eagles again over the Giants. Uh, the Cowboys clinched the NFC East with a win and an Eagles loss. So a very outside shot. They would have to have the Eagles lose to clinch the NFC East, but it's certainly possible. Moral of the story is there's a lot of games that matter and there's a few games that don't matter. Uh, a couple more games real quick before we get into our quarterbacks. Uh, the Bucks and the Falcons, no playoff impact there. Bucks have kind of locked up their spot. The Falcons have nothing to play for. That doesn't mean there's not some DFS value in that game, though. The Texans, the Colts, no playoff impact. Again, doesn't mean there's not DFS value in that game. Chargers at the Broncos, this one's interesting because I think the Chargers have uh, quite a bit to play for. And I'll have to double check this, but the Chargers can secure the five seed if they win, if they beat the Broncos at Denver. Why does that matter? Because it means that they likely in round one won't have to play Kansas City, Buffalo, or the Cincinnati Bengals. Those are the three teams you want to avoid. So I think they're going to be really trying to win this game and secure that five seed at Denver. And we know Denver is probably going to be very competitive, too, because they just want to win. Their coach just got fired. They need some confidence with guys like Russell Wilson, Latavius Murray. Like Those guys are absolutely in play, uh, whatever healthy receivers they have. So um, something to think about there. I, I think the Rams and the Seahawks and the Chargers and Broncos are, are two of the games that I'm going to be focused on this week. For, for whatever it's worth, most of the totals are very low. Most of the totals in all these games are between like 39 and 42. So we're not necessarily looking at totals as much this week. We're really looking at game scenarios. There will be some backups where we're going to have some information as to hey, this backup is playing like pretty much all four quarters. So we're going to want to like grab some of those guys in those situations. But we're also going to be looking at starters in very competitive games like this Rams Seahawks games, like, like this Chargers Broncos game, like some of these teams that maybe on one side have something to play for and on the other side don't. So there's going to be uh, guys to grab here. Let's bring up the QBs. It looks like Zach already has them pulled up here. Thank you, Zach. Um, Jalen Hurts at 8,200. I mean, do we want to play Jalen Hurts? I, I, I don't I don't think so, but we, we'll have to wait. Like, I, I don't know if he's going to be limited. I guess that's why I'm saying I don't think so with Jalen Hurts. I don't know what the situation is going to be with, with him. They do need to win. So if he's a full go and if it doesn't look like there's any limitations, you know, even if the Giants don't play all of their starters, the, the Eagles still need to secure the victory, right? So at what point do they take their foot off the pedal? when they're up, you know, 28 to seven, you know, so how many points can we bank with Jalen Hurts is, is really the question there. At this point, I think he's an okay play. I haven't decided. I need more news on Jalen Hurts, to be honest with you, if, if I'm going to play him, but he certainly sticks out at the top. I'm worried about Justin Fields and a potential injury. I know he's not listed on the injury report, but it looked like something was wrong last week after the first quarter. He rushed for hundred yards and then he got like completely shut down. So Minnesota's at Chicago, Fields at home. If I'm the coach there, uh, do I even roll Justin Fields out? I mean, I, I kind of just don't get it there. So uh, Fields is a no for me. If you want to take the chance and play him, I totally get it. Justin Herbert at 6,800 at Denver. He hasn't been good for the last half of the season. Um, but this is a game where, you know, they do need to win. And I think Justin Herbert makes a ton of sense against Denver's defense, which we know can absolutely wilt. The can, can, I don't want to say it can give up, but like Justin Herbert could throw it around here. It's just a matter of who you want to play him with. I think guys like Keenan Allen, Mike Williams are obviously in play. Austin Eckler, obviously in play. So I think Justin Herbert is in play too. I think I would even consider him, if you want to play cash this week, I think I would even consider him in a cash lineup, although he has been a little underwhelming. Geno Smith at 6,000, home versus the Rams. Lockett gets another healthy week, so hopefully that finger injury is, is starting to heal a little bit more, but you can pair Lockett uh, with Geno Smith or DK Metcalf with Geno Smith. Um, you could take a chance on Noah Fant. I think that makes sense. Uh, Russell Wilson, he's 5,400. Home against the Chargers, that's not a daunting matchup by any means. And Russell Wilson, I don't know if Russell Wilson's good or bad at this point, but I do know he has 
uh, he's going to be playing at 100%. And I know he's going to have the backing of his team. And I know they don't want to get embarrassed on the last week of the season. If anything, this is a team that wants to go out on a winning note. So I, I think in cash, Russell Wilson makes a lot of sense against the Chargers defense that you can throw the rock against. And you can run against them too, which I think put, puts Latavius Murray in play. I think Denver is going to try to show out this game, even though they don't have anything to play for. I think Baker Mayfield at 5,200 at Seattle. Uh, probably not. If I'm going to play somebody there, it, it's probably Cam Akers at Seattle. But if you wanted to speculate on Mayfield, just trying to show out his his last game uh, as a starter for the Rams, most likely. Uh, I think that's something that's actually like at least worthy of a conversation. Sam Ellinger at 5,000. He looks like he's going to be the starter for the Colts. You know, we remember back in the day when Sam Ellinger was 5,000. There was a lot more value then than it is now, perhaps. But he's home versus Houston. And I think if you try to get lucky with Sam Ellinger and maybe not Pittman, uh, but Pittman's fine, but maybe with um, Paris Campbell, for example. I I think those are the types of those are the types of stacks where if they splash, you can be in really good shape. But again, we're not really looking at value as much in this one, especially at the quarterback position, because there's going to be so much value that we'll talk about it on the game by game preview. So many backups that are going to be starters that are going to be like a flat 4K or receivers that are going to like, we know we're going to be playing a lot that are like 3,600 or 4,800. I don't think you really need to go. Here's, here's my point. Play whatever quarterback you think is going to do best in, in terms of their projected total, not necessarily points per dollar, because I don't think you need to worry about taking the value quarterback contrarian quarterback. That's cool. Value quarterback. I just, there's going to be so much value. I just think you can play whoever you want, to be honest with you, almost across the board. Let's go to, by the way, Blaine Gabbert, Desmond Ritter, you want to play that game. They're both 4,900. They play each other. Uh, You know, Desmond Ritter needs some reps. Maybe he runs around a little bit more and maybe he peppers Drake London. Maybe that's a stack you want to get into. Maybe you want to play Tyler Algier at running back, which we'll get to in a second. But as far as the quarterbacks, right as we sit here right now, to me, it's Justin Herbert, it's Russell Wilson, and maybe I take a shot at Sam Ellinger, who who has one more chance to prove himself as a – not as a starter, really, but as a potential backup in this league. And, and we know Jeff Saturday is going to want to win. He's he's fighting for his job and, and just coaching relevancy at this point. So let's move along to the running backs. Again, please join us for our game-by-game preview, which is going to be with Mike McClure tomorrow at 5 o'clock. Austin Eckler at 8,900. Again, has plenty to play for. Let's click on his game log, actually, because, man, if you played Austin Eckler and you played, let's say, um, Mike Evans last week, you like probably won a million dollars. Austin Eckler was was fantastic in terms of the production. It was a little bit of what we saw, you know, when he was really efficient earlier in the year. 10 rushing attempts for 122 yards against the Rams. You know, file that away, right? Because that's against the Rams, right? And we just talked about how the Rams are playing Seattle. Okay, if Austin Eckler can do that, what do you think Ken Walker is going to do? Just asking. 10 rushes, 122 yards. That's an average, quick math. 12.2 yards per carry with a long rush of 72 yards. He did that early and often, frankly, but that 72 yarder was, was early four receptions on four targets, amazing efficiency, um, got in the end zone two times. Just the guy was an absolute animal. I, I expect if they do really want to win, which they do, uh, he's probably going to be an animal this week as well at 8,900. Now you can pivot off of him and just think to yourself, well, Maybe it's going to be through the air with Keenan Allen, which makes a ton of sense because Keenan Allen, other than last week, has been absolutely dominant. Um, as we go down the board here, I think Ramondre at 6,700 at Buffalo. I, I, again, there's a little bit of an unknown there, uh, especially with Damian Harris and just the whole Buffalo situation. So not a running back I really want to speculate on. 6,200, at least not, not right now. Uh, 6,200 Cam Akers. Uh, another chance for Cam Akers to kind of prove himself against the bad Seattle run defense. I think a lot of people are going to be playing him for for good reason. Cam Akers finally looks at, like the Cam Akers that we thought he would look like at Florida State or coming from Florida State. Um, this is a really dynamic running back. And, oh, by the way, he tore his Achilles last year. And he came back and played in the same season, which is stupid, which doesn't make any sense, which is why he was extremely inefficient in the Super Bowl and perhaps why he was extremely inefficient at the beginning of this season. So I think we're starting to see the Cam Akers that we thought we were going to see when he was drafted. Uh, And I I think he has another shot to prove that against Seattle. And I I think he has every intention of doing that. So hopefully he gets a full complement of snaps. If he does at 6,200, I absolutely love that matchup. Najee Harris at 6,100. 
the worry here is Jalen Warren got a lot of production. He was very good with it. So maybe maybe Jalen Warren is a sneaky play, but Najee Harris against Cleveland, it's certainly a great matchup. I would just really worry about the volume here. In fact, let's pull up his game log. And then maybe when we scroll down, we're going to pull up uh, Jalen Warren too. Because Jalen Warren, to me, looked way more effective between the tackles than uh, – than uh, Najee Harris. But Najee Harris really showed out at the end of the game. He ended up with 22 carries, 111 yards, five yards per carry. That's that's very good. I actually didn't realize he had 22 carries there. And he had two receptions on three targets. One was the game winner at the end. An amazing catch by Najee Harris, by the way. A lot of receivers don't make the catch he made in the corner of the end zone under those circumstances. So uh, I'm, I'm clapping. I'm literally clapping right now for Najee Harris because that was awesome. And it kept Pittsburgh in the playoff hunt. Again, credit to Mike Tomlin. Uh, when we go down, I want to check out Jalen Warren's uh, stat line too because this is this is pretty good. Obviously, the volume was there, and if the if this volume is there against Cleveland, give me a break. I mean, he is going to be smashing this slate. So I do. I guess I do like Najee Harris in spite of uh, Jalen Warren per, perhaps getting some carries there. There we see Jalen Warren. Yeah, so he had 12 carries, you know, and, and he was way, you know, he's a lot more efficient than Najee Harris, 6.3 yards per carry, and you saw it if you watch that game. Every time Jalen Warren got the ball, it just looked like he was he was pushing for five or six yards, which we see here, 6.3 yards per carry. Najee Harris, he was kind of dancing in the hole before he even got to the hole. He was you know, like stutter stepping a lot. I just don't think that's super efficient. And, and I don't think I would be I wouldn't be surprised at all if Jalen Warren at 4,400 gets 14 carries or 13 carries against Cleveland and Najee Harris gets 15. I just think it could be like close to a 50-50 split. I think Jalen Warren has earned a role in that department, but it is a must win. Do you, do you lean on Najee Harris more than Jalen Warren? Probably, but I, I thought Jalen Warren was really impressive. So it's just something to think about. Najee might be a little bit more underwhelming than you think, and Jalen Warren could be a little sneakier than you think. Okay, let's go back up to Tyler Algier at 5,600. Tyler Algier is at home here, and he's been getting all the volume, and I don't see why, as a rookie, uh, he wouldn't be getting all the volume again at home against Tampa Bay, who's likely rolling out a lot of backups. So Tyler Algio got a lot of volume last week, as we anticipated. Wasn't as efficient as I thought he would be. Didn't get as much in the receiving game as I thought he would. Nonetheless, he got a touchdown. He got 83 yards and 12 yards in the receiving game. So not a disaster by any means uh, for him. We have Latavius Murray at 5,400 at home versus Los Angeles Chargers. I'm not a Latavius Murray guy, but you're playing the Chargers and the Denver Broncos probably are going to fight to win this game. Latavius Murray continuing to fight for running back relevance. I mean, I think this guy's 32 years old and is still, you know, probably wanting to play in this league another year or two. I think he's 32. I'm, I'm going off the top of my head there. Uh, so I think Latavius Murray is certainly in play again against the Chargers run defense, which has improved a little bit. So I'm not saying Latavius Murray is any sort of smash play, but at 5,400, he certainly makes sense. Zach Moss at 5,200 home against the Texans. Well, that makes sense, right? You're playing the Texans. So should I just stop talking? You're playing the Texans. He's the starting running back. What, what, else, what else do you want me to say? Let's actually pull up his game log real quick. He hasn't been super efficient. Keep in mind, this is a young running back, too, in his second year. You can scroll up for Zach Moss. He's, uh, he's over at 5,200. Keep in mind, he's in his second year. He's, this guy's really trying to prove himself, too. And, and I think Jeff Saturday is going to give him a leash. I think the key to victory here for the Colts, and this is me backtracking off my Sam Ellinger take, is probably just to give it to Zach Moss 20 times. Give it to Deion Jackson six times, you'll probably win the game here, especially with that defense. I mean, Colts defense might be an interesting one to play in um, in DraftKings, obviously, because uh, Houston just hasn't been moving the ball effectively, unless you play the Chiefs. When you play the Chiefs, you, play, you move the ball effectively. You could be TCU, and you probably move the ball effectively against the Chiefs. But against most other teams, that they just haven't been moving it effectively. Oh, you can send your hate tweets to at Sia Najad, by the way, Kansas City fans. It won't be the first time. 15 carries, 74 yards, 4.9 yards per carry. That's, it's not bad. This guy, again, trying to prove himself. I think he's a pretty good running back. You know, he played at Utah. Uh, a knee injury did set him back. I think he, he had a pretty bad knee injury at Utah, and it's kind of slowed him down a little bit. But I like Zach Moss in this game. I think he's a fine play. Keyshawn Vaughn at 4,700. Now we're getting into speculation season, right? Because doesn't I, I doubt Fournette's going to play. Why would you roll out Fournette, especially with the list Frank uh, sprain that he's been nursing for I don't know how long? And then, of course, who, who's, who's the backup that I'm forgetting on the, um, on the uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers? The guy that's Rashad White. That, that's probably just as good, at least between the tackles, as Leonard Fournette. I don't think either of them gonna, are going to play a ton. So it could be Keyshawn Vaughn season at Atlanta, which 
pretty good matchup. Uh, Khalil Herbert, another guy, speculation season, 4,600. Does David Montgomery play a full slate of snaps? Probably not. Uh, I'll probably avoid Khalil Herbert, but I just think he's interesting um, in that 4K range. We'll probably have some other 4K guys on our game-by-game -game preview tomorrow. Let's talk about receivers real quick. This list is not exhaustive, by the way. So, again, we'll talk more about some of these receivers tomorrow, but – We'll start with Tyreek. Mike Lennon, I'm guessing, is going to be the starting quarterback. Listen, if Joshua Dobbs can do it, uh, I think Mike Lennon can come in and, and probably do it. Joshua Dobbs, slightly a veteran, but never started a game. Uh, Mike Lennon has started plenty of games, and he's certainly a veteran. By the way, Joshua Dobbs, um, he majored in school. Uh, what was it? Like some sort of uh, like astrophysics or engineering or, or something like that. I can't remember. And he maintained a 4.0 GPA doing it. This guy's a really smart guy. So if you're going to bring anybody, if you're the Titans, you're going to bring anybody in and say, hey, can you start right away? Joshua Dobbs is that dude. So credit to him. I thought he looked good. Hope, I'm kind of pulling for the Titans. I think that'd be a great story if they beat the Jacksonville Jaguars under these circumstances. I talked about um, Tyreek. You know, you can play Tyreek or Jalen Waddell. I probably won't get there with them. But, uh, you know, anytime you play Tyreek, you have a you have boom potential. Keenan Allen at 6,900 at Denver. No problem there. You want to play Justin Herbert to Keenan Allen and call it a day and just move on to the next game or, you know, run it back with, you know, I got to see who's exactly healthy in that Denver receiver core. I, I think Judy and Sutton are both healthy. Dulcich we know is on IR. So something to consider from a Dulcich standpoint is Albert O who flashed a little bit last week. I believe he's 2,900. We'll get to him when we get to the tight ends, but there's some runbacks for Denver for sure. So we'll, we'll monitor that and we'll talk about it more tomorrow. Uh, DK Metcalf at 6,700. Home versus the Rams. Seahawks have plenty to play for. DK Metcalf probably is going to be that dude relative to Tyler Lockett, who's still kind of nursing a, uh, a broken finger that he's playing through. Uh, Mike Williams. Listen, if you want to do a double stack, Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, I'm probably not doing that. If you want to just get away from Keenan and hope Mike Williams gets a little bit more volume than usual and cashes in on two long catches, I'm not mad at you for doing that. 6,600 at Denver. You know, he could absolutely pop. We're, we're, we're looking at Mike Williams like we're looking at Mike Evans, right? Can he have that pop game? Yes. Is it more likely than not that he has that pop game? No, it's not more likely than not. It's more likely than not that he has four targets and, you know, catches three of them for 61 yards and, and zero touchdowns. But again, this is a guy that can get behind the defense. Chargers likely um, playing hard and Denver likely playing hard. So these teams will be pushing each other. Something to consider. I, I put Jerry Judy down here at 6,300 again. I don't think he, let's go to 6,300. I don't think he has an injury designation which will help in that analysis. Scroll down a little bit, Zach, to 6,300. And yeah, no injury designation. Let's see what he did last week. Oh, seven of eight targets for only 38 yards. That's interesting. And it looks like uh, underwhelming performance came on a day when he led the team in targets. Okay, so leading the team in targets is all I really need to see. We know J Judy is good for Simiak. Great route runner. Can absolutely get behind the defense, whether he's catching the ball behind the defense or just running past the defense. So I, I like Jerry Judy a lot as a run back in this game. Uh, and I think you could stack Jerry Judy with Russell Wilson. Throw in Albert O if you want. And let's let's run it back with one or two Los Angeles Chargers. Let's just get let's just get our let's just get our feet wet in this game and call it a day. Amari Cooper at six thousand at Pittsburgh. Uh, probably don't love it, but Amari Cooper is one of those guys that again I almost put in the Mike Evans category where every so often he can flash, and we saw what he did against Washington last week. By the way, anybody catch what I said about Taylor Heineke and Carson Wentz? Not that it was groundbreaking, but dumbest decision. I think it's the dumbest decision I've seen from a personnel standpoint. I can't remember the, the last time. I saw something like that where you put in Wentz for Taylor Heineke. I was all over Twitter on this. I was all over this show talking about it. I am like, listen, I think Ron Rivera is a great dude, but I, I was like legitimately disgusted at that move. I, I could not believe it. And Carson Wentz went full Carson Wentz. Is anybody surprised? I, I, I don't think so. Drake London, 4,900 home versus the Bucks. Desmond Ritter. Trying to hit, his, you know, next year it's going to be the Desmond Ritter show. He's going to try to hit his favorite target. He's going to continue to. Drake London continues to be low priced. He didn't have a great game last week, but can he flash against some of the Bucks backups? Yep. So I think Drake London is very much in play at 4,900. KJ Osborne, 4,700 at Chicago. Maybe we want to monitor the weather in Chicago in some of these places. I think if you want to chase KJ Osborne's points, feel free. Uh, we might have. Justin Jefferson play a few less snaps. Adam Thielen play a few less snaps. So I think KJ Osborne is fine. Paris Campbell, 4,300. You're just taking a shot there. Home against Houston. I don't think you need to stack Paris Campbell with 
Ellinger, I think that's an okay contrarian stack if you if you want. But um, I think Paris Campbell could be okay against Houston. Rashid Shahid's forty two hundred home against Carolina. Do you want to continue to chase those points? Yeah, probably. I I, I think Shahid is okay at forty two hundred. Van Jefferson thirty nine hundred at Seattle. Then I put Rashad Perryman down here at thirty five hundred at Atlanta. I only put him down. I almost he almost kind of represents a bigger group that we may talk about tomorrow, where these backup receivers on some of these teams that don't have something to play for, they're very much in play. And if you happen to construct a lineup that has a bunch of expensive pieces, then, and you have to dip down, then what you're looking at is wide receiver threes, fours, and fives potentially on teams that have nothing to play for. And I think a guy like Brashad Perryman fits into that mold. Who are the other guys that fit into that mold? Stay tuned for our game by game preview tomorrow with Mike McClure at five o'clock tight end position. Uh, We've got George Kittle. 6,000 at home versus Arizona when I went over the playoff scenarios, which I did sort of at the top of, of this portion of the show. Um, San Francisco technically has something to play for. So I, I, the, the party to, to Kittle connection certainly makes sense. And we know Arizona can't defend the tight end. So that's going to help Dalton Schultz. We know the Cowboys still technically have something to play for. He's 4,500 at Washington. I think it's a, even though the matchup doesn't look great, uh, for in terms of opponent rank, I, I think Dalton Schultz could have a nice game against Washington. I wonder what Washington's state of mind is going to be. Um, just epic collapse over the last few games. So uh, I think Schultz is in for, for a pretty decent game. I think you could play a lot of receivers in, in that game, including C.D. Lamb. But I think Schultz might be like the easy check down option as Dallas just slowly rolls over the Washington commanders, Tyler Higby at 4,400. Again, that's a competitive game, most likely at Seattle. I like him. Noah Fant. You know, it's kind of a, again, Will Disley's not playing. That's one of those, you, you hope you get lucky with Noah Fant at 3,500. And can you? Yeah, you can. It's just, you know, what are the chances he, that he catches a touchdown passing, you know, gets over 40 yards? Not not very much, but again, that's a competitive game. He's the only tight end on that team that's going to be catching passes. And then I mentioned Albert O at 2,900 uh, with Dulcich on IR. If you're just trying to get, if you're trying to do a, a Russell Wilson stack and you want to throw an extra piece in there, or if you just want to throw in a tight end, let's actually look at Albert O's game log here. As you, you've, already, you've already beaten me to the punch. Six targets caught three of them. 25-yard touchdown, 45 yards total. Does that tick up? And from a target standpoint, it doesn't have to at 2,900. I, I think it might. I mean, I, I think he could have somewhere between five and eight targets. And if he catches three or four of them, he's already paid off his price. I mean, like literally. So uh, I think the upside is there. We always kind of conceived of of Albert O, at least last year. I wasn't an Albert O guy, but, you know, he does have some upside and he's always been in the coach's doghouse. I think there's something just maybe off the field that he's just not getting, maybe with the game plan, uh, whatever it is. But this is the final week of the season. This is week 18. It's a chance for Albert O to prove himself, which now – Doghouse or not, it's it's his show with Greg Dulcich on IR. It's a chance for Russell Wilson to try to establish and prove himself. It's a chance for the interim head coach to try to prove himself. It's a chance for Jerry Judy and Cortland Sutton to make a connection with Russell Wilson that they can think, okay, I can carry this over to next season and have some confidence in the offseason. These are chances for the Denver Broncos to think, at least think, that they might be relevant in the AFC West like I thought they would be this year. Uh, And so I think this is actually a pretty important game for Denver. And so I think this is a game that is fully worthy uh, of attack on both sides of the ball. All right, Zach, I think that's it. But I do want to look at some questions. I I didn't get a chance to really look at any questions on here. Was there anything that was was maybe we need to get to? No, I I think you brought up to Josh Jacobs. You you don't think he's going to you think he'll play the full game just to maybe get that rushing Rushing record. So my, and I'm not looking at it right now, but I think he's so far in the lead. Cause here's the thing. Last week I looked at it. He was beating Derrick Henry last week by about 120 yards or something like that. Derrick Henry didn't play and Josh Jacobs played. So I, I just don't, it, I think Derrick Henry would have to rush for like 200 yards or something. I, again, I'm not looking at it right now, but I think Josh Jacobs had a, had a reasonably good day last week in terms of piling up some yards so i i think he's already secured it maybe he plays like one quarter or something i wouldn't play him in um you know what's interesting though he's on the saturday slate so we're just gonna have to wait on the news on that he's got man i just want him to cash in so bad because he's in such a tough spot at, at the running back position um my guess is he'll play I just don't know if he's going to play for that. That's such a high game in terms of scoring. I think it, it, on that Saturday slate, it might be worth 
fading Josh Jacobs, playing Jared Stidham, like literally at the quarterback position with Devante, maybe double stacking him with Waller, running it back with a couple of pieces on Kansas City. Like, let's say Jarek McKinnon, Travis Kelsey, you can afford to do that most likely because you're playing Jared Stidham. Try to get some other cheap pieces in there, maybe steal a couple pieces from that Titans game. Maybe you're able to get Derrick Henry. Maybe you decide to fade Derrick Henry. But there's other guys in that game like Travis Etienne. Like the, I think that Saturday slate is incredibly interesting. I think there are guys that are – I don't think Joshua Dobbs is in play, but I think all three other quarterbacks are probably in play there. And each of those quarterbacks – have receivers that are completely legit. So even though it's a two game slate, I think there's going to be a lot of differentiation. It's not going to be like everybody's going to Kansas city or everybody's going to Trevor Lawrence and company. I think there's going to be some people that are going to go especially after seeing what Jared Stidham did last week, they're going to say to themselves, I'll take the discount here because it's going to allow me to pile up Kelsey with Derrick Henry or, or Derrick Henry with Devonte Adams or however you want to construct your lineup. So I'm actually really excited about the Saturday slate. I think I brought it up last week. I haven't looked at it yet, but um, obviously week 18, a lot of the guys have the contract incentives in terms of stats. Mm-hmm. So it's probably worth looking and see who needs what and then throwing those guys in your lineup because you know they're going to get the ball. Yeah, that's a great point. And that's something I will take a, I'll take a look at as well uh, coming into Thursday's game. I, you know, I, I looked at that last week and it didn't seem like it was as, as big as it is on in terms of like, opportunity for some of the guys we might play in DFS as it has been in previous years, but it's definitely something. Um, and that, that stuff is out there. It's definitely something to look into and, uh, and make sure we nail down. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, All right. I think that's, I think that's pretty much it. Listen, uh, I do appreciate everybody jumping in. It's obviously a weird time in, in, in more ways than one, right? Because we're all awaiting the DeMar Hamlin news. And obviously the show is, is normally not at 10 30 on a Wednesday morning. Um, we hope, this can serve as like somewhat of a distraction to you while you still keep, you know, at the forefront, uh, your, your sort of your thoughts with uh, DeMar Hamlin and the, the Buffalo Bills and DeMar Hamlin's family. So if this was able to serve as, as somewhat of a distraction, that's great. Um, if not, then I get that too. Um, but the bottom line is uh, we were happy to do the show. We were happy that some of you were in the chat and uh, we'll certainly be back here tomorrow to discuss uh, this entire uh, slate by doing our game by game preview and we'll uh we'll touch on do we have a thursday night game how come i don't know the answer to that question no, not this we week. don't no. okay so no showdown to talk about um again we're all just kind of waiting on uh what the news is going to be with damar hamlin i know i'm going to be attached to twitter kind of waiting for that news as updates kind of continue to, to pour out every three or four hours from relatives or representatives um of damar so Um, everybody keep him in your thoughts and I'm glad you were able to join us. And if you're listening, I'm glad you were able to listen and we'll see you tomorrow uh, for our game by game preview. This is fantasy football today. DFS. I'm Sina Jad. That's Zach Brook. We'll see you tomorrow.